Okay, good evening, folks. Well, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight uh, for this program, Building Bridges, Exploring Economic Ties Between North Carolina and Japan. And my name is Satu LeMay, I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center, and um, I'd like to just open with a couple of remarks about the East-West Center for some of you who may or may not have heard about our institution and why we're doing this program and how it relates to the Asia Matters for America initiative. Um, and then we have such a distinguished group of initial panelists and then a fireside chat type discussion amongst experts. So the East-West Center was established by the United States Congress in 1960. And its purpose in the congressional language is to promote US-Asia relations uh, between the peoples and governments of the United States and Asia through collaborative study, research, and exchange. And we are uh, a public law uh, of the Congress, and we get partial funding from the United States Congress through the State Department Foreign and Operations Budget. And we are a part of the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau of the State Department. Um, the, the governance structure of our institution, um, the Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, last week appointed five members. It doesn't matter which party or who's the Secretary of State. On a rotating basis, he or she will appoint uh, five members of our board, and the governor of the state of Hawaii, where we are have our main campus, appoints the other five. And those ten, in turn, select five from the region. And we have a very distinguished board human rights lawyers, public intellectuals, and others, uh, business folks uh, from across Asia as well. So I wanted to mention the, the institution not only as an advertisement and why we're here, but also to explain um, the purpose of this particular program. We are not focused on any one community, officials, artists, students, scholars. We engage the peoples and governments and institutions across Asia, running essentially, roughly, from um, India East, but it also includes, can include Central Asia and South Asia, can also include folks from Europe and other parts of the world, in, insofar as they're working on relations related to US uh, Asia. And um, the purpose of uh, our effort for a program like this is part of a program called Asia Matters for America, America Matters for Asia which seeks to take the abstract elements of US-Asia relations, defense policy, security, foreign relations, and bring it home. Because one of the things that's really key to recognize and to promote, I think, is that much of the work of US-Asia relations is done every day at, at the level of people and states and subnational levels. And we have with us, for example, today, Kevin Monroe from the governor's office here in North Carolina who graciously took time away from his duties to join us for a governor staff program that recently went to Japan and Korea. So we're trying to engage both sides of the Pacific and to build relations that will advance commerce, education, civic society, um, uh, sharing of uh, uh, experiences and values, etc. And so in the spirit of this, um, we have a program called Asia Matters, as I said, that has numerous versions, Japan, ASEAN, uh, APEC, all kinds of different ones. They're in your flyers. Please take a look. You can download these in order not to waste paper. All of them are available with a quick click on asiamattersforamerica.org. You can download the PDF. They're used in curriculum. They're used in briefings. They're used for chambers of commerce. Our main use in Washington, D.C., where I'm based and our team is based, Amy Namor, and uh, we have with us Zoe Weaver and Lance Jackson, um, is with the Congressional Caucuses. Because there are, tend to be Congressional Caucuses for each of these countries or organizations or regions. And so we work very closely with them in developing these publications in order to highlight the way in which these countries, regions, or institutions impact American life and how um, the United States impacts those countries, regions, and institutions. 
So that's a brief background, and um, I'm happy to answer questions when we have time for networking and, and throughout the program. But I really do want to get to the program because it's, it's really incredible who we have here. And I would like to just very briefly, because you have before you in your packets the full bios and the incredible accomplishments of the panelists who will join us, but I did want to flag uh, the first panel that I have the joy to, uh, uh, to welcome, and that is um, Secretary of Commerce of North Carolina Department of Commerce, Michelle Sanders. May I invite you, please, Secretary, to join us. Uh, Christopher Chung, who's the Chief, Chief Executive Officer, Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. And Michi Calcano, Executive Director of the Japan America Society of North Carolina. And again, I mention all of this in the context that these are the people who at a day-to-day -day level, at a subnational level, are keeping the gears of the US-Japan relationship, amongst other relationships, going. And we wanted to get a chance to hear from them in the spirit of this program on building bridges between uh, North Carolina and Japan. Thank you, Secretary. Please, and invite you to. Oh, 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 we're going up. Oh, oh, oh. Did you want to speak from here, or did you want to speak? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, oh, okay. I thought we were all just doing okay. remarks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. LeMay, and good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for being here for this important meeting, which will help build and continue to strengthen our ties and our relationship uh, with this agency. I'm honored to bring greetings from Governor Cooper, um, who hosted us last week at the Governor's Mansion, and I see some faces that were present at that time, um, where we were focused on our Japan and North Carolina relationships, specifically in the Southeast region, as we are about to host our Seuss Japan Conference in October of this year. Um, and that was a good gathering as, as well. Um, it's great to be here to, to highlight some of our uh, and work with some of our highest profile executives um, that are in the area, Japanese executives. As you guys know, our economy is uh, dynamic when it comes to the relationships that we have, especially with Japanese-owned companies. More than 30,000 North Carolinians go to work every day at the Japanese-owned company, and 225, over 225 Japanese-owned companies operate here. Uh, in the state. Um, most recently, or actually it seems like it hasn't been that recent, but Toyota had uh, one of our historic announcements making a $14 billion investment in North Carolina and with plans to hire over 5,000 people in Randolph County to help with the manufacturing of um, batteries for electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles at their facility. To name a couple of others that hopefully you're familiar with, Fujifilm Dyson um, has, I believe it was 700, over 700 jobs um, that Fujifilm Dyson is creating and investing over $3 billion with their North American largest manufacturing facility in our region. Honda Aircraft, Hitachi, um, those are just to name a few, and we even have Japanese candy made in North Carolina. Uh, Morinaga, I believe, is the name of that candy, um, and that factory is just outside of Orange County. So as you can see, we have a presence here um, that contributes to our economy, contributes to the communities across the state, and importantly, contributes to the lives of North Carolinians. There are many reasons that those companies have chosen to be here. One of the reasons is because our, of our talent. That is what I believe to be the biggest reason, reason. But importantly, because of the relationships that we continue to build and develop over many years um, and that we value as we work together to work for the common good. Um, you know, North Carolina has an office in Tokyo and has had an office since 1978. Um, since companies were considering investments here. And in 1980, under Governor Jim Hunt, uh, North Carolina Japan Center uh, came about to strengthen the academic ties with business and cultural ties with Japan. So we are excited about the continued relationship and all that is possible as we continue to work together and build those ties. 
Um, I mentioned the Suits Japan Conference, which is our southeastern U.S. states and Japan. Uh, that conference has taken place for many years. I can't say right now exactly what that number is, but I'll just say many years. Um, it has been one where we have all reaped the benefits of that through the ties that have been um, built and the exchange of information that we share with each other and relationships beyond the conference. I mentioned that this year we will be hosting, North Carolina will be hosting in Charlotte in October. And I hope that you will join us for that uh, conference and there are members of Commerce who are here today and EDPNC who you can talk to and get more information about what to expect and all of the excitement that will take place during that time. So thank you all very much for being here and thank you for continuing to help us help each other to remain uh, connected together and continue to build the relationships that we value deeply and that we appreciate um, today and going forward. So thank you all very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me join you all today. I'm really excited about the program tonight. Uh, I know most folks in this room are local to Raleigh, uh, but even if you are local, if you've never been uh, where we are here at the uh, Ralston Arboretum, there's a lovely Japanese garden. Um, actually, today is like a beautiful day to go check it out, but it's a Japanese garden that even features a, a kare sansui, which is a traditional like Japanese rock garden. It's really lovely and just a great place to waddle away the hours, especially now that the weather is reliably pleasant. Um, really appreciate the chance to be with you all today. Uh, Japan is a, a special place for me. Uh, I, I serve as CEO of the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. Uh, but growing up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, in the late 70s and 80s, Columbus was actually one of those places that had a pretty big Japanese expat population because Honda has a major assembly plant there. And I went to school with lots of kids uh, who were you know, of the families of the Japanese expats. And I grew up in a time when Japan was in an economic ascendancy throughout the 80s, many of you probably remember. So it made good sense as the child of immigrants from Taiwan uh, to study Japanese language, not only because there was good professional reason to do so, but at the time it was more personal interest. And for a lot of my formative years, basically from age 12 to the end of college, studied Japanese pretty devotedly. And for a long time, I thought my life, my professional life after college would be exclusively focused on Japan. Fast forward 20 some years, and while it's not exclusively Japanese uh, oriented, anytime I get a chance to do anything involving Japan, there's certainly a uh, a happy nostalgia, if you will, about all those years that I spent learning the Japanese language and culture, and to be in this role today where I get to contribute to a strengthening of relationships between our state and this country of Japan, that's always going to be special to me based on the experience that I've had earlier in my life. Um, I'll echo a lot of what Secretary Sanders said. She and I work together every day on behalf of North Carolina to attract more jobs and investment from all over the world. But as you heard the secretary say, there is no country that is more important when it comes to inbound investment in our state than the nation of Japan. Uh, you heard the numbers the secretary said, 30,000 North Carolinians going to work every day for Japanese companies, 200 some companies across multiple communities in our state. It is an important location and it is continuing to get even more important. Some of the more recent additions to our Japanese business community just in the past couple of months alone the governor and the secretary announced Kyowa Kirin, a major player in the life sciences industry, a couple of weeks ago. And then back in late 2023, Dainipon Printing, which is manufacturing components for electric vehicle batteries, which is a big, big industry opportunity for North Carolina. These are just two of the latest companies to put down their stakes in North Carolina because of our workforce, because of our business climate, and frankly, because we have spent many, many decades now fostering greater ties and connections with the Japanese market. And that is something we will double down on in the years to come through our Japan office and through events and partnerships like today. Uh, it's not a secret, uh, it is out there in the public, but hopefully you all have seen the news about Prime Minister Kishida planning to visit North Carolina in the wake of his meeting with the president next month. That is an honor that has incalculable value North Carolina in the Japan market and will continue to amplify 
the North Carolina brand to all those Japanese businesses that are thinking about where in the United States they choose to go in the future. Secretary Sanders and I would love them to come to North Carolina, it goes without saying. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up with just one concept. I do remember my Japanese is long, long, uh, rust of, you know, gone rusty, but uh, one Japanese word that I always uh, really appreciate is the word kizuna. So kizuna means ties or bonds, but it's these things that really contribute to the strengthening of these very, very important relationships that we develop throughout life and through business. And the kizuna, the bonds that we have between North Carolina and Japan cannot be overstated. They will remain impactful and important long after all of us in this room are gone through the work that Japanese companies are doing here, through the jobs they've created, and through the investments that they've made in our communities. And we're just happy to be part of a state team that celebrates these relationships and continues to do everything that we can to strengthen those. So hope we have a great dialogue tonight. My colleague is going to be up here on stage in a little bit to talk to you a little bit more about our work in Japanese investment. But thank you for taking time out of a lovely evening to support this important relationship. I'll turn it over to Michi Kalkanio. behind the podium. Can you see me? Yes. I'm afraid you're only going to see the top of my head. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here tonight to speak with you all. I am the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of North Carolina. New to this role, somewhat new to North Carolina. Um, I am very honored to be here amongst these very distinguished uh, folks here who know so much about um, U.S.-Japan relations and are doing so much for North Carolina. Um, let me first say that these are exciting times for North Carolina. Um, it's uh, the Japan American Society of North Carolina is one of 38 societies in the country. And we are the second youngest as the one from North Carolina. We started in 20, 2016, and we are growing. Um, we're trying to keep up with the investment that is coming into this state. We have um, historically been focused on business programs. More recently, we are expanding and broadening our scope to include language programs, cultural programs, social activities for our members. Some of these include, um, this week we are having a, an emerging technologies uh, conference. Mr. Chung is going to be um, at that as well as Mr. Robinson. Um, and I hope you will join us if you have time. Um, we are also doing uh, other activities. We have um, sporting events that we're trying to do uh, where we're supporting our Japanese players here in North Carolina at the NC Courage. Uh, we are also um, doing uh, more outreach as far as um, supporting language programs across the state, K through 12, and also university language programs for the study of Japanese. We are uh, also doing a lot of uh, cultural programs where we're going into schools and we're uh, sharing Japanese culture, Japanese dance, uh, for example. Uh, we're also bringing in a joy coordinator from East Tennessee who's going to be doing some programs where she's sharing origami and dadama painting and, and tea ceremony. So we are trying to um, engage our community more and teach them about Japanese culture, so there's an appreciation. We have um, one of the, the big things, um, Chris, you mentioned Toyota Battery coming into the state. We are having a large welcome picnic um, for a lot of the new Japanese families that are moving into the state. Um, and that is in collaboration with the NC Japan Center where we're having it. Um, and also um, some of the local local organizations like the Chapel Hill Durham Japanese Association. So we are um, working hard to um, really spread um, the culture, the language, 
um, educate North Carolinians about the importance of our relationship with Japan. And so I, um, I would love to talk to any of you who might be interested in any of our programs after the panel. But I won't take any more of your time because I know we have um, a great panel to listen to uh, now. Thank you so much to the East West Center for inviting me to speak and to share a little bit about the Japan American Society of North Carolina. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Well, again, thank you to Secretary Sanders and to um, uh, Mr. Chung and, of course, Ms. Caliano for uh, joining us today. And we have, uh, as was mentioned, a terrific panel to get into some of the more details of the North Carolina-Japan commercial relationship. And I'm just delighted uh, that all of them have agreed to join us this afternoon. Um, and the session is going to be moderated uh, by Mr. Stephen Sumner, Director, North Carolina-Japan Center. And we have with us on the panel, and he'll say more about introducing them and, um, and, 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 and the details of the panel, but I want to welcome to the panel uh, Mr. David Robinson, Mr. Thomas White, and Mr. Jonathan Brewster. Please join us in the front, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, always excited to see people share an interest in Japan the way that I am interested in Japan. Uh, real quick, before I let the panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to just say a real quick word about myself. Uh, Stephen Sumner, director of the North Carolina Japan Center. Uh, I spent 23 years uh, working in semiconductor materials and transportation. 15 years of those were in Japan. Uh, working directly with my Japanese customers, getting beat up uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> no better way to learn Japanese, right? Um, however, I decided to step away from corporate life and try to contribute back to students uh, who are trying to make their way through uh, the university system. Uh, I come from Mount Airy, North Carolina, a northwest part of the state, tobacco farm. Arrived at NC State with red clay on my shoes like a lot of us did. Um, and I started taking Japanese. Uh, as an engineer. So I graduated with industrial engineering degree, but I had a minor in Japanese and was able to actually intern in Japan for two summers while I was a student. Life-changing uh, for you know a kid from Surrey County. So I now, in the position that I'm in at the North Carolina Japan Center, get to help other students uh, achieve those dreams. Uh, helping them get to Japan, helping them figure out what their path is gonna be no matter what their major is. Um, and also making that critical <coughs> academic link uh, between companies here in North Carolina, so Japanese companies based here in North Carolina, and the talent that we're graduating who understands uh, their culture, speaks their language, and wants to do more. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of that uh, chain of this whole economic development uh, activity here in North Carolina. So that's who I am. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll just have the panelists just give a brief background on each of themselves, and I guess I'll start here to my right with, uh, with Tom Rose. Thank you, Stephen. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Tom White. I'm the director of the Economic Development Partnership at NC State University. Where I've worked for 16 years and have the very good fortune to work with our 38,000 students nine or 10,000 faculty and staff, and uh, just a wide array of land-grant institution, uh, smart people who, to try to build an economic development ecosystem across the entire state. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Brewster. I'm on the business recruitment team at the Economic Development Partnership in North Carolina. And I spent about, I guess, all put together about 10 years living and working in Japan. First uh, for the JET program, if you're familiar, uh, in Shiga Prefecture, and then working in the high performance computing sector at uh, Fujitsu headquarters in Tokyo. And after that role, um, I had Steve's job for a little while, for about five years in North Carolina Japan Center. And Tom White gave me the bug for economic development, so he's to blame. <laughs> and uh, for me to go off to uh, EDPNC. So it's wonderful to be with you all tonight. 
I'm David Robinson. I apologize in advance if any of you were looking for sort of a Geraldo type show. Um, <laughs> we still have time. We have we tremendous. Uh, you've got a bunch of people here, and you, you'll hear the theme throughout the night. Uh, we, we agree on the importance not only of Japan, but what it involves um, resource wise and what it contributes to our, our, our communities. So I grew up in Tokyo. Uh, my childhood was spent sneaking on the military bases because that's where the really good candy is located. <laughs> uh, coming back, I uh, went through Georgetown School of Foreign Service, thought I would be a diplomat, became a lawyer instead. But um, uh, eight years ago, I became the honorary consul for Japan here in North Carolina. That makes me a, I'm gonna go 80% of a diplomat here in North Carolina, the sole Japanese presence here in the state. Uh, I also chair the uh, Japan American Society of North Carolina, and Michi makes us look good. I have very little to do with that organization, but I will say also we we're going to talk about a pipeline of uh, building bridges, and one of those, one of the one, one of the best hooks we have is an anime conference every May. That's where we get the kids, um, and I chair the board that puts that on. 12, 14,000 kids will study anime. Or we'll, we'll, we'll participate in the anime conference in May, and we'll go on to study Japanese at NC State University. Pleasure to be here. And David, if you want to, go ahead and keep the mic, and we'll get you started with the first question, if that's okay. So the state of North Carolina hosts 52 post-secondary institutions awarding more than 31,000 STEM degrees annually. This contributes to the state's skilled workforce, which ranges from vocationally trained trade professionals to researchers with advanced degrees. How do Japanese com uh, firms contribute to the continued development of North Carolina's workforce, part one, and do you see this workforce as a large draw for continued investment from Japan? I'll take that in reverse orders and si simply um, reiterate what Secretary Saunders said. Um, the reason foreign companies in, in general, and Japanese companies specifically, succeed in the state is because of the workforce that they come to tap into. Um, a lot of people find out about North Carolina still because they know Michael Jordan, maybe they've heard of NASCAR, there's other reasons people have heard of North Carolina. The universities are the hook that get them here. Community colleges are what keep them here. We were just talking with Guilford Tech uh, yesterday as part of the SUS conference. And you know, re rest assured those 400 students studying uh, aviation technology at Guilford Tech Right? That's related directly to the fact that Honda Jet is building one of the coolest looking airplanes in the world here in North Carolina. Right? There's this incredible connection to the fact that when EDPNC makes an offer to a foreign company for an, you know, any incentives package is going to is <coughs> most assuredly going to involve workforce training. Um, if you do a survey, as the Japanese government does, of uh, concerns what keeps Japanese executives up at night, right? Workforce is the number one concern. Um, and North Carolina, better than any other state that I've seen, and, and certainly I'll even go on record as a member of the Japanese government and saying that North Carolina does that. They tie the workforce development to the recruitment effort better than any other state that I've seen. All right. Yeah, Jonathan, uh, you want to take a crack at that? You stole all my thunder there. <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm actually been thinking about this for a while, right? You know, how, how do Japanese companies contribute to the workforce in North Carolina? And it really goes full circle, right? Japanese companies are coming to North Carolina to take advantage of the fantastic workforce that we have, right? That are across industries. But they're further, further developing that talent starting even before you know, the, the, the college uh, system. I mean, we do have 58 uh, community colleges throughout the state and, and incredible uh, training programs, customized training program for each individual uh, operation in the state uh, that goes through that. But we're, we're seeing companies go into manufacture, uh, into elementary schools, middle schools, and to talk about their operations. And this is something that I remember was just starting to happen when I was leaving high school. So that, I think it's really something that is, we're looking at the entire uh, at the entire line of workforce, right? Starting very, very early, right? But what gets them here is the workforce, and then they're going back to the beginning and developing that further. That's just going to further strengthen 
our workforce um, competencies into the future. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Tom, how about you? Uh, how do Japanese farms contribute to the continued development of North Carolina's workforce? Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Secretary Sanders alluded to a couple of momentous events in 1978. It was very unusual for a state, especially a southern state, to establish an office in Tokyo, and then in 1980, establishing the Japan Center. In between those two years, in 1979, in his first term, Governor Hunt called upon his fellow NC State alum, Bill Friday, who was president of the UNC system, to establish the Center for International Understanding in this wonderful colossus known as the Research Triangle Park which uh, is just uh, a great example of forward-thinking visionary leadership. In 1981, he established the Microelectronics Center in North Carolina, and the secretary alluded to this. In 1982, Mitsubishi Semiconductor America chose to locate its USA headquarters in Durham, North Carolina. And Kazuo Watanabe did an ad for the Durham Chamber of Commerce at the time saying, of all the places around the globe that I could live, I, I like Tokyo, but I like Durham best. <laughs> And uh, then, then we had a floodgate open up of Sumitomo Electric choosing to locate its fiber optics division in the Research Tunnel Park, uh, looked at, at the restrictive covenants, built their R&D inside the park in one building, put their manufacturing in that same building outside RTP, Japan Metal and Chemicals, Jim Nichols is here, just an awful lot of the draw of RTP. And then the Secretary Sanders alluded to this, as did Chris Trump, you, you've got Fujifilm Dyson coming in 2021 with a cell culture plant, but you can trace that all the way back to ASI Pharma Technology in the 1990s, making Aricept in RTP, uh, being acquired by Biogen. So you have different industry clusters that have been recognized. If you go back to that 1979 establishment of the Center for International Understanding, you've got 16 UNC system members. That's roughly 240,000 very smart people. You add the North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities, add another 100,000 students, and Jonathan alluded to this colossal 58-member uh, uh, North Carolina Community College system, another 600,000 people. That's the draw, that's the magnetic attraction that we have. So we want to continue and sustain that inward investment that we've been so blessed to start over 45 years ago because of this visionary uh, you know, uh, attitude that Governor Hunt had, along with the Biotechnology Center, along with the School of Science and Mathematics. And I have to say this, the Japanese companies have embraced that. They have been so wonderful in supporting those institutional assets. They get involved, they get on their boards, their people get involved in volunteering, and it's been alluded to by Steve as well. You have an awful lot of people that get involved in K through 12. That's why that School of Science and Mathematics is so important. We celebrate the higher level institutions, but having that K through 12 engagement is very critical, Steve. Great, thanks Tom. Jonathan, I'll ask you to kick this off on this next question. Um, so it's obvious that Japanese companies have really taken to the state of North Carolina, and they see our value proposition uh, as an investment destination. So the question now is, what are some remaining challenges and barriers that Japanese companies face expanding uh, in the state, and how are these shortfalls being addressed? That's a really good question. Um, that's actually, a big thing for the North Carolina Japan Center. Um, I think I would say that the, the biggest challenge is that cultural divide and ensuring that uh, families, individuals and families that are coming to our great state from Japan to contribute to our workforce, to contribute to our core competencies in the state, are supported, that they're connected to the right resources. They don't come over here feeling like they're, they're on the outside. We want to welcome them and ensure that their family members are also connected to the community. And we do have the Japanese language school, right? We actually have two in the state, right? We have one in the Raleigh area, one in Charlotte. The communities that are built up around those centers are extremely important. We want to support those communities. But each of us has to do our part to ensure that we're extending beyond that, right? And to ensure that all of these people have the connections to how do they get real estate, right? How, how are they going to buy a house? How are they going to get a driver's license, right? How are they going to just go about their daily lives and integrate? And so really, that's the biggest challenge that I see. But I think we're doing a great job of doing that as long as we stay on the ball and stay on target. All right, thanks. Uh, let's have David. 
uh, take a crack at the same question. What do you see as the challenges and barriers remaining for Japanese companies expanding in our state? So taken to a, a more fundamental level, but kind of tied to the first question, you know, the, the fact that Japanese companies come here with a long-term perspective, the fact that we have invested in Japan, with the Japan Center, with the office in Tokyo, from a long-term perspective, solves a number of the problems that would typically exist, right? If I'm a student, my ROI on studying Japanese is a much easier decision for me because I know that all these Japanese companies are gonna bring other Japanese companies and the, the workforce numbers, when I started this eight years ago, I, I started my speech like everybody starts their speech with this morning, 12,000 North Carolinians went to go work for a Japanese company and we're hearing 30 plus now and that's just, we're just getting started in this state, right? With the, to, to, uh, with the, with the battery announcement. So um, I, I wanna echo um, Jonathan's comment about kind of the, the, the soft sell, if you will, right? The familiarity, I'll see, you know, I, I'm sure Mecklenburg does the same thing and major metropolitan areas do, but you know, in Wake County here, there's a map. And there's a map with all the flags of all the countries on it who have invested and put a plant here in North Carolina. That's a dramatic selling tool for the state, right? Because it shows Japanese that, again, going back to maybe they only knew about Michael Jordan, now they're seeing that there's a, there's, there's a familiar, their tribe is already here, right? And there's an infrastructure to support the, um, the, the expats that are being transferred here. From an expat pers perspective, you know, what put the Japan Center, I think, on the map? And it was strategically a small thing, but or, or it was it was a, a, a low cost event, but strategically so monumental to the recruitment effort and to the health and well being of the Japanese here was to simply translate the Japanese the, the DMV handbook into Japanese, right? Uh, happy wife, happy life. Uh, but you know, it, it helped facilitate. The, the integration of the Japanese community into North Carolina. And ultimately, that's what building bridges is, right? The companies in write checks, but the people that come here become ambassadors for us. They go back to Japan. Um, that's why I'm an ambassador, if you will, for Japan, because my childhood there was welcoming. I saw Southern hospitality Japanese style. That's why conferences like this are so invaluable because we're then figuring out strategically how to impart that Southern hospitality to the next generation of ambassadors that are gonna come, they're gonna do their tour of duty here, they're gonna, they're gonna learn things from their American coworkers, they're gonna impart knowledge to their American coworkers, and they're gonna go back and they're gonna say, wow, North Carolina has their act together. And that's an exciting, that's just, it's an, it's an exciting road to be on. And again, I really appreciate the East-West Center sort of facilitating this kind of dialogue. We can't talk about it enough. All right, Tom, you want to? Yeah, real quickly. Add your perspective. We talk a lot about collaborative spirit, and uh, Chris referenced Dining Pond Inc. and printing. The first joint venture that we actually saw in Research Triangle Park was Dining Pond Inc. and Chemical, and Right Hole Chemical, the German enterprise and the Japanese enterprise, moving its U.S. headquarters into the Research Triangle Park. Uh, Secretary referenced the fact that Fujifilm Diocent, the partnership between a Japanese enterprise and a Danish company, uh, we saw that initially back in the early 1990s when Governor Martin was in his second term. Corning had joint ventured with two divisions of Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Mitsubishi Petrochemicals, to build pollution abatement equipment that we had because of the EPA headquarters in Research Primal Park. It all goes together. And that was not done everywhere back then. So that global spirit was imbued in an awful lot of the economic development that we saw. It's still relevant today. You think of all the things that we're looking at. Uh, you know, we, we think Bloom Supersonic building in the Triad. We're, and we're first in flight, right, Chris? Not, not Ohio. We're not <laughs> uh, you can trace that back to the aforementioned Honda Jet and Honda Aero that came. That was highly competitive in Greensboro and Burlington. And so it goes all the way back to the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk. Uh, there's an awful lot of translation. And that pharmaceuticals at North Carolina Biotechnology Center, that I think is a global asset. And we've seen that's why we've become so prominent and that we can compete against New England and Boston and the West Coast. The Japanese investment here has actually uh, really helped 
catapult us into that position. So we want to sustain it. And David and Jonathan have already talked about it. Not every state has a Japan Center. Not every state has a Center for International Understanding. Not every state has that culture for a North Carolina Coalition for Global Competitiveness or Robert serves on the side with that place. And uh, so it's, uh, we're a think and do university, but uh, SA Quam Viderity, to be <laughs> rather than to seem, I think that probably is apparent uh, with the way we try, try to construct our economic development family. And uh, David and Jonathan have addressed that very well. Excellent. We've all been so potent and succinct in your responses that I think we have time for a bonus round. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Lance, we're looking good? All right. All right, question three. I hope you uh, read to the end of the email. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's start. Uh, we'll start, uh, how about we start with David this time? Uh, so David, I'm gonna ask you, what is the principal opportunity for Japanese firms in North Carolina whether it be a focus on the state, the Research Triangle Park, Raleigh, et cetera, what, what do you think there? Principal opportunity for Japanese firms. I, I mean, th th there's an obvious answer, right, which we have now attracted um, marquee named investments into the state that will draw tangential investments into the state. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't, uh, honestly, coming to North Carolina, I didn't appreciate that fully until I happened one day to be on the backside of the BMW plant, and it looked like Laredo. I mean, it, there were trucks queued up in and out of that plant, and, you know, I didn't fully appreciate what a big, you know, what, what I don't know what they call these, these whale investments, right? Um, can do in terms of contributing to kind of the creation of an entire ecosystem. We have that, certainly we have that opportunity, right? Um, we've got marquee name Japanese companies that have called North Carolina home for a little while, and we've got some new ones that are, that are putting us on the map. Um, in addition, I, I, honestly, I, I want everybody to please attend the Seuss conference that we are hosting in Charlotte in October. It, you know, they are great conferences, but none of them will compare to what we're about to do in October in terms of, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna highlight the Southeast US because that's the name of the conference, but we're also gonna highlight what North Carolina does especially well in the Southeast, right, is to create these ecosystems, to create these environments where Japanese companies feel welcome, where their expats feel welcome. And um, I, you know, I think that's the that's the real opportunity, right? Um, is is to make ambassadors of the folks who are already here. I mean, if you're looking for, um, you know, additional, obviously we've got a name now in life sciences. We've got a name. Uh, you know, I'm not sure we. Somebody said we dodged the bullet on uh, on on you know old fashioned car technology. Uh, you know, be that as it may. But you know, certainly we're 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 in the cutting edge now, right? For battery technology, we saw it not just in Japan. We got Vinfast coming in for Vietnam, um, which is you know a ground up automotive plant. Um, I do think life sciences for sure. I, I, I'd like to say you know still the two largest industries in um, in North Carolina is military defense services and agriculture. I do think food processing is a tremendous opportunity for us. Uh, continues to be. And you know, perhaps not direct to the military sales, but certainly the collaborative um, process that the Japanese have learned to some extent from us, right? You see Nagoya University coming to NC State, learning about how university and public-private partnerships work. Um, we do that really well, and I think you're going to start seeing more Japanese companies come in here and, and kind of, you know, uh, Honda Jet was is an entrepreneurial success story. Right, it's it's a it's a cool it's a cool plane, but it's a, it's a Japanese entrepreneurial success story. And those of y'all who do business with Japan realize that that can be few and far between. This is the kind of place where stuff like that happens. And so I, I don't know that I have specific sectors, but I do have I, I think really great hope that these ecosystems are going to continue to expand. Fantastic, thanks, David. Yeah, Jonathan, you want to. Share your perspective. By the way, David, how that aircraft, the first aircraft that was built at, on the job, how was that designed? How was it drawn up? Do you remember? 
It was on the, it was on the back of the calendar. It was drawn on the back. And if I'm not sure if all of you are, are aviation buffs like me, but you'd be surprised at how many aircraft have actually been designed on the back of the cocktail napkins. It's a little scary. Um, I mean, talking industry specific, if, if I think most people in here know this, when you look up the, the, the overall investments that Japanese firms are making globally, right? The, there's one of these three that kind of surprises me, but the, the first one is general machinery, right? Just nuts and bolts machinery. The second one is electric machinery and electronics, not a surprise, right? Uh, battery components, battery technology folds into that industry. The third one is leather and rubber. That's a big industry for, for Japanese firms. But that also includes synthetics, right? Think non-wovens, uh, you know, non-spin textiles, things like that fits into that industry. The one that's not talked about enough that you're going to see a lot more of is life sciences. Right? We're, we've already seen that. We've seen Fujifilm Dyson Biotechnologies make their home here. We just saw the, the huge investment from uh, Kyoakini. There's also others that you may not know of that are do, don't go through our office necessarily. You know, uh, as on the business recruitment team, I'm taking uh, qualified leads usually for projects. I'm managing those projects to completion. Those can be regular projects, they can be really big projects, marquee projects. But there's also a lot of mergers and acquisitions happening that might not go across our desks. You know, uh, Sumitomo Pharma is huge in the life sciences space. They've bought up a few business concerns in North Carolina. Uh, startups, uh, things that came from incubators. These things are happening, and I would just say that that's probably the biggest opportunity right now, comparatively speaking, is life sciences. And stay tuned because I think it's going to be more on the horizon. We, we can also look at the Chips and Science Act and semiconductors. I mean, we had our two largest spin out successes at NC State of the SAS and Cree, bless you. And Cree's came out of the lab on campus in the late 1980s, but they noticed Mitsubishi Semiconductor's success in the early 1980s. So if you fast forward to that and see what our nation is doing now, we're a $39 million hub here. Thanks to that Chips and Science Act grant, the Southeastern Hub, a little uh, university like MIT is the New England Hub, uh, Stanford, the Western Hub. So certainly semiconductors in that supply chain. We've already referenced the colossal Toyota, $14 billion investment, 5,000 jobs. You know, we chased Toyota back in the 1980s, the Camry plant, but with persistence and patience, we wound up getting Aishin AW. So automotive, definitely, even in com uh, combustion engines. I mean, all of the Toyotas that are assembled in Georgetown, Kentucky, have the transmission built in Durham, North Carolina. Thousands of great jobs for our, our folks. And Chris, ch we chased the Toyota Mazda plant that went to Huntsville, but they, you know, stayed in there. So we've learned a lot of lessons, but certainly semiconductors and automotive, and. Um, and it's already aforementioned life science and biopharma, certainly. Um, I have to say this, the secretary mentioned Maranaga, which is in Orange County in Mebane. Uh, they, uh, Steve Brantley, who's a friend of ours, had worked for the State Department of Commerce. He, his his uh, blood runs Carolina Blue. It broke his heart last year when Maranaga signed a long-term contract with Duke University's basketball team to advertise <laughs> the Cameron Indoor Stadium. But David referenced consumer products and A, that's certainly something that we want to actually you know, uh, aspire to, to attract too. And it's a joint venture, it's win-win actually, and that's been alluded to. I think that's the theme of the presentation today. You want to make, you want to look for win-win propositions. That's the value we have here. Um, nobody asked me, but I'll just throw in a couple of two cents real quick. I like Jonathan's comment about entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, entrepreneurship, really interesting. So spending 15 years working in Japan, uh, I agree, you don't see a lot of huge successes come out of entrepreneurial endeavors, but the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in Japan. Like I don't think I've ever met as many small business owners as I met while I was in Japan. Uh, certainly not compared to, to the US where I think it's kind of hard to get something started on Um if you look at what we have, we have experience in entrepreneurship, but we're no Silicon Valley, right? Japan is hungry to learn how we do it. Um, and I think if we get in early and we get in with the right um, the group of people here in North Carolina, I think we have a real opportunity to collaborate with Japan on how to get that entrepreneurship engine running in Japan, uh, which you know their economic health is great for us long term because that money will come back in in some other form to North Carolina. But also, uh, you know, being 
around college students a lot. Having those college students and North Carolina entrepreneurs, even if they're not in college anymore, exposed to the Japanese way of thinking, the Japanese way of product development, how do you think your way through uh, a product? How do you think your way through a business, right? You're writing 30-year business plans, not you know two-quarter or one-year business plans to keep everybody happy. I think there's a lot to be gained from that kind of interaction. I think we got the, the stuff here in North Carolina to really make a, a, an interesting connection. I just wanted to, to chime in really quick because I, I didn't want the entire, you know, um, exploring economic ties to be about foreign direct investment. I think to some extent U.S. states get blamed for that, uh, that that kind of myopic behavior. But um, the having foreign nationals here collaborating with North Carolinians also exposes us to our, our, and our companies to opportunities in export markets and exports create jobs as well. And I, the more Japanese companies that are here, I mean, everybody talks about it in 2014, right? Honda started exporting more cars than they import to the United States. It's kind of a, I, I assume they still do that, but you know. Um, exports to Japan and licensing of technology and other things that are probably highly underreported are also critical to the state of North Carolina and the people of North Carolina jobs that they create. We make things, and we grow things, and we engineer things that the rest of the world wants to buy. And I, I applaud both there's federal resources here and state resources here that are committed to you know helping, and Japanese resources of course as well, um, helping companies succeed in the Japanese marketplace, which is a challenge, but also a tremendous opportunity as well. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that we talk a little bit about um, not just the foreign direct investment being important in North Carolina, but also markets for our products that are open. That I mean, we we are you know the, the the rule of law is equally important in Japan as it is in the United States. We play by the same rules, and those markets are going to be really good for us for a long time to come. And so it's really helpful to have these dialogues that. Expose North Carolina companies to the fact that, well, a they're in they're in the global economy whether they want to be or not, but also as long as they're in it, lots of opportunities in Japan for their products as well. Yeah, the intrinsic value surrounding all of this interaction. Right? We haven't even talked about travel and tourism, but we're hosting the U.S. Open in June 10th to mm -hmm. June 16th, and one of my most memorable um, uh, occasions was to watch Hideki Matsuyama Yama's caddy a couple of years ago when he won the Masters, removed the flag from the flagstick on the 18th hole at Augusta National and bow. That is in all of the annals. It just shows the class. And uh, golf is really important. We haven't even talked about travel and tourism and how important that is. That's a global game today. So that's just a great memory. So that's another opportunity we have to showcase this great state. The only thing that I, I don't understand is, you worked at Intel in Japan, right? Yeah. You're from Columbus, right? <laughs> how, how did that happen? How did we lose Intel to Columbus? I'm sorry about that. Different panel conversations. Yeah, Lance, how are we doing? Yeah. All right, Dr. one more comment, and then we'll wrap it up. I mean, just one other uh, little bit of an interesting anecdote here is that is everyone familiar with the concept of Kaizen, right? Continuous improvement. This is largely. Um, seen in manufacturing operations in Japan. I did a little bit of research in this recently, and this is something that's being exported by Japan, that know-how, into not only the US, but also other uh, countries, including developing countries. And so I think that this is also a great opportunity to create some, some uh, co-creation of value by, uh, by bringing in more Kaizen experts in North Carolina. And I've actually seen, if you've been on some uh, you know, manufacturing floors in North Carolina, Every once in a while, I'll, I'll ask, did someone come in and redo your operations, you very clean floors, things put away where they're supposed to? And more often than not, that answer is yes. That some sort of expert in Kaizen has come in. So anyway, just a little interesting anecdote for you. And just so that nobody gets in trouble, uh, Kaizen is continuous improvement. Kaizen is cooking your books. So make sure that you're not engaged in any Kaizen activities, right? <laughs>
All right, and with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, I think we're out of time, but appreciate the panelists all making themselves available today and sharing their thoughts and uh, expertise with us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Sumner, and thank you to this terrific panel. We're uh, about to close out, but I can't help but saying, you know, I, we're coming down to North Carolina. I was thinking about all the things. I've been here a couple times, but it's just for memories and the delicacy of issues, NC State and UNC. I'm in Georgetown, Hoya, and this month, 41 years ago, something happened on the <laughs> NCAA final, as some of you will remember. And so those memories run deep and long. And I imagine uh, any foreign investor in North Carolina has to be careful about navigating your sports teams and our university. <laughs> but I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, I, I do have a couple of uh, takeaways. Um, I was writing the notes, you know. It struck me that many states across our country uh, compete for global investment, trade, market, sports, tourism, leisure, all kinds of things. But what I hear, heard here today was really particular, and we do these programs on Korea, on Southeast Asia, on Australia, across the country, been in multiple states, multiple cities, uh, certainly on Japan, all over the country. Um, but I heard things that were really quite astonishing to me. Um, the role of expats and how we treat them, the translation of the, the, of the licensing uh, exam, uh, the map of flags, and the rule of law, infrastructure, high technology, uh, southern hospitality. And I, I wrote all these things down and I kept thinking, you know, this must be a marketable North Carolina secret sauce uh, because you've done remarkably well. And some of the data on how states compete, uh, North Carolina really stands out uh, in, in some of these areas as evidenced by the, by the facts on the ground as well. And so um, I kept thinking about this secret sauce and how uh, this uh, could be uh, uh, if you will, crossed with your uh, barbecue and with your tonkatsu sauce. Um, and I was thinking that you guys should write a book about the way in which North Carolina has approached, not a book in a sort of purely academic sense, but kind of like how to attract um, these kinds of investments that you've done and the sort of forward thinking. So first of all, I want to say um, it's a pleasure to do a program here because there's so much we gain for our interactions with the caucuses on Capitol Hill, with the chambers of commerce, when we go to Japan and do programs, when we do other programs around the country, to share some of these findings and the ways in which it also informs our research and our products and our analysis and, and, and thinking. So I want to be uh, very thankful to all of those of you who spoke on the first panel and of course the other panel. There are a couple of thanks. Uh, before we go to the networking and reception section, and there's a lot of food back there and, and some soft drinks um, to enjoy and on this beautiful evening. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Embassy of Japan in Washington, represented here today by Ms. Uh, Tomoko Nakamura, who uh, came from Washington to join us. I we worked very closely with her on, on many programs, and we're very grateful for her support of this one. Um, I also want to again thank and mention Kevin Monroe, who, as I said, from the governor's staff, joined us for the first inaugural governor's staff program that the East West Center put together. And that inspiration and that inaugural program that Kevin participated on and helped us so much plan this program is now going to be a set piece of our work across the United States and bringing subnational officials from the region to the United States to keep these ties going in an era when globalization is contested, when I wouldn't call it isolationism, but certainly insulationism is, you know, um, part of our discourse, part of our, our national uh, debate. Um, and at a time when things are changing very rapidly, whether it be technology or AI or, you know, all kinds of things are changing the, the groundwork on which we will do business. So for us, um, as we think about the East West Center's mission established by Congress to promote collaborative research, study, and exchange, how do these global changes affect the way in which we do business and engage with human beings, whether they be artists, scholars, government officials, policy makers, members of the elected legislatures and Congress? This continues to inform our work. And finally, I want to thank the terrific team we have at our East-West Center in Washington office, 
Amy Namar was our is our program manager for the Asian Lavish for America. Lance Jackson is our uh, economic uh, development specialist, formerly at the Department of Commerce in Washington, and of course uh, Zoe Weaver, one of the rising stars um, in the academic and policy relevant work on Taiwan. In fact, uh, you can appreciate how uh, dedicated she is. She got back yesterday from presenting a paper on Taiwan after the elections in Slovakia, in Bratislava, last night. Uh, last night, did I get the right name? Yesterday. And came, uh, joined us overnight to come here for this program. So you can see what a uh, terrific uh, crew that we have uh, at the East West Center. And so may I just close by saying thank you so much for joining us this evening in this beautiful setting. And uh, we hope uh, you'll join us for some refreshment and some food and for some networking and, and sharing. And uh, again, thank you all speakers and participants for joining us this evening. Good evening.